Hi guys, Dr. Gillard here again. This is cardiovascular and pulmonary pathology. It's fall 2020. That's week four. It's Tuesday. I'm actually, I kind of messed up my initial slides. The initial 10 slides or so got knocked out. I don't know what happened to them, but I started with Marfan syndrome and it kind of didn't make sense because then I started talking about aneurysm. So I lost this little introduction. So therefore I'm going to paste this in uh, in front of the regular lecture. So uh, this one will be on YouTube only. So aneurysms 101. <clears throat> so it's important to remember the pipe here, especially the abdominal, uh, the aorta in general. We have, the, here's the aorta, and the heart's been removed. So we have an ascending aorta. We have an aortic arch here. We have a thoracic aorta. It has a, it goes through the diaphragm. And then it, once it goes through the diaphragm, it becomes, uh, through the aortic hiatus, I could add, it becomes the abdominal aorta. And then it splits into the common iliacs, external iliac, internal iliac. Once it goes under the inguinal ligament, it becomes the femoral artery. All right, so that's just a little review. Let's also remember the takeoffs here. Uh, so we have the first takeoff is the brachiocephalic trunk, also known as the nominate artery. And then we have that splits into the right common carotid and right subclavian. And then we have the left common carotid here. And then we have the left subclavian. All right. Celiac trunk is here. Superior mesenteric, inferior mesenteric. And then we have the renal arteries. So these are important because we can have emboli released from different aneurysms here. And you have to know where they have a chance to go. Like if I say the patient had a dissecting thoracic or a, a dissecting aneurysm in the thoracic aorta, uh, which one of the following would not occur? Stroke, a infarct of the kidney, an infarct of the liver, an infarct of the stomach, or an infarct of the intestine. Well, it couldn't be a stroke because, remember, the, if the aneurysm was here and the blood clot got loose here, it's impossible for it to go upstream. So it could cause any of those, it could get stuck in any of these other pipes and cause damage, but it's not going to go back up. So you need to know this, uh, this system. In general, an aneurysm is an outpouching of a blood vessel. We're going to look at the different types of these. But remember, these pipes are under very high pressure. And if you get a weak spot in the, uh, in the tunics, in the vessel wall, it's going to start to bulge out. And there's different ways it can bulge out, which we'll look at here. These can also occur in the heart. They don't, why don't they occur in veins? It's almost unheard of for them occurring in veins. Because they're under low pressure. If it does, it, there have been some cases in the popliteal vein. Uh, but usually it doesn't occur in veins. They can be acquired from injury. We'll talk about true and versus false aneurysm. False aneurysms uh, can occur. But they can be congenital. We'll look at berry aneurysms probably on Thursday. They could be, or they could be acquired as well. Maybe you have got an infection of an, a, a large blood vessel and it damaged the wall. Uh, in order to be called an aneurysm, it has to balloon out by at least 50%, according to Rubens. Uh, these aneurysms may or may not be hiding a dissection within them, and we'll talk about dissecting aneurysms and how dangerous those can be. But in general, it means that the vessel wall, the integrity of the vessel wall, has been compromised. Okay. Uh, by something. It could be a catheter injury. It could be an old infection. Um, yeah, it could be an injury, a puncture. Maybe you're in a sword fight and got stabbed through one. So there's some kind of weakening that occurs. Connective tissue diseases naturally weaken. Mar We're going to talk about next Marfan syndrome. Uh, and there's Louis Dietz syndrome. There's type 4 Ellis Danler syndrome. Neurofibromatosis 1. Uh, but yeah, the ballooned out vessel could. The danger with an aneurysm, of course, it could pop. And 
the aorta is under high pressure and you could bleed out really, really fast depending on where it pops. You slip into your blood pressure will drop, you'll go into hypovolemic shock and die from that. Heart will stop beating. Uh, the blood flow in an aneurysm is definitely non-laminar, therefore oftentimes, especially in saccular am aneurysms, they are a blood clotting machine. You can get thrombus formation like crazy and therefore you can get embolism formations and we're not talking about venous embolisms which are dangerous enough. These are more deadly or more disabling. I mean you can lose your liver, you can lose a chunk of your stomach, you can uh, if they get up in your brain you can have a stroke. So these are very dangerous, these arterial embolisms. So what are some risk factors for developing aneurysms? Well, we have to talk about the connective tissue diseases. And so you need to know these like the back of your hand. Marfan's, uh, Ellos Danlers type 4, the vascular type, Louis Dietz syndrome, neurofibromatosis 1. They can all put you at risk for developing an aneurysm. That's where we're headed. So let's start off with Marfan syndrome. It's rare. I mean, this is my benchmark. I usually don't talk about diseases that are rarer than Marfan syndrome. So, population, people of, what's prevalence again? I always think prevalence is P, population. P goes for population. So, the r number of people running around in our population right now, about 0.01% of our population has somebody with Marfan syndrome in it. It's autosomal dominant. Autosomal means it's not a problem. A mutate. It's not a mutation in the sex chromosome. It is dominant, meaning it's powerful. I think dominant. You just need one bad gene to get it, and you got it. Now recessive is not dominant, so you need two bad genes to get recessive problems. And it's a disorder of connective tissue. Basically, connective tissue is shoddy. It's stretchy, it's not strong, it leads to aneurysms, causes long bone growth, it causes a bunch of things. Uh, yep, so story with that. So some classic signs of Marfan syndrome. People tend to have very long fingers with this disorder. That has a name, it's called arachnodactyly. Long fingers and toes, arach arachnodactyly. They also tend to be very, very tall, like this guy is a Marfan's uh, patient. Uh, they can also, except uh, in addition to the skeletal system, which is the least of the concern, it's they can have problems with the eyes, the heart, and the arteries. I mean, the eyes are important too, but not. I mean, the big worry is problems with the heart and the arteries. People are tall and slender. Kind of anecdotally. Uh, I have known some Marfan's student, or, yeah, students before, and one of Marfan's patient before, and they're all super flexible. They could all do this. And this is the dorsum of the hand. It, I mean, I try to do this, and I can't even get my thumb up to, I get my thumb about right here. <laughs> that's my dip, or that's my, the tip of my thumb goes right there, but they can bend theirs all the way back there. So that's kind of an, an, a, an anecdotal test to see if maybe, and it doesn't have to have more. I mean, there's other connective tissue diseases, as I've talked about. Louis Dietz, Ellis Danlers, just to name a couple more. Two most common, now uh, more stars here. Two most common problems uh, would be, and concerns, are problems with the heart valve, specifically the aortic valve, where it gets damaged from the disease. It gets too stretchy and it doesn't seal. Remember, we've talked extensively about how the aortic, the semilunar valves in general, they have to pop open and catch that blood, that backwash of blood that, that comes from the kind of contraction of the aorta. And they don't. They leak. So you overfill your left ventricle. We've talked about that a lot. Um, that's called aortic insufficiency. Some call it aortic regurgitation, but insufficiency is the word you'll hear. Ectopic lentus is the other problem. Uh, this is a dislocation of the eye, and this is a big problem because you can't see. 
heart valve. We kind of covered this already. Um, so those affected tend to have stretchy valves. Everything I've said, they, they don't seal uh, during diastole. It's really diastole. I mean, you now it's really diastole that's the problem. Uh, so blood leaks back or regurgitates into the ventricle or maybe it's a problem with the mitral valve you can have mitral valve insufficiency another aka regurgitation another aka mitral valve prolapse so that's possible but this one is by far the most common and we've talked about this yeah, so this is diastole so remember the systole kind of stretched out the aorta the ascending aorta and the aortic arch Diastole, it springs back and it shoots blood this way. And normally these valves seal shut, but this patient with Marfan's, it doesn't seal very good. It's flimsy. And we have a hole, so blood gushes in here and it fills up a part of the ventricle. Not the entire ventricle, but that's no good because now we have atrial systole occurring and that's injecting blood and overfilling the heart. Right? And overstretching the heart. Right? And what happens when the heart is overstretched? So one of the Starling's principles. Uh, it, it has a reflex contraction that's way too darn hard. Uh, and great. So you blast blood out the heart, but you're wearing out your heart. Your heart can't keep doing that forever, and you'll ruin your heart. Right? And pretty much everything I just said right there. So basically you get a decrease of cardiac output because you, you've lost. This is supposed to be part of the cardiac output going to supply the cells of the body. Maybe this blood was destined for the brain and it didn't come out. Right? So you have a decreased ejection fraction or decreased cardiac output because it leaks back. Uh, remember clinically these patients will have a water hammer pulse or could have a Watson's water hammer pulse or Corrigan's pulse. It's all kinds of... Uh, we, we, we talked a lot about that already. Uh, a, a visible huge bulge in their carotid artery uh, during systole, which just kind of sucks up. It's really prominent and then it disappears, and really prominent and disappears. I guess water hammer came after a, a child's toy. You can Google that and see what a water hammer it is. Plumbers know about that noisy pipes sometimes are secondary to this water hammer phenomenon. That's where it kind of got its name from. And everything I've said already, it overstretches the heart, Starling's principle comes in, and you wreck your heart, right? It also speeds, the heart has to speed up on top of that because you're not, you don't have as much blood being ejected from the heart, so you have to compensate for that by speeding up the heart. So these patients have to be monitored by a cardiologist. Usually by the time they go in to the cardiologist, there's, they're having, having dyspnea on exertion and they don't feel good. And the rule of thumb is they have about five years. I actually know, know over the past, I know a student who had uh, this problem. And um, yep, about five years is all the cardiac uh, cardiologist gave the student. And you're gonna have to have a replaced aortic valve, which isn't the end of the world course that's a fairly successful surgery um, but there's more to the story so if we have a heart that's overfilled if we have a left ventricle that's overfilled with blood uh, then you have trouble filling that left ventricle and you start to get a beaver dam in the heart plus you have heart backwashing in so that basically creates a beaver dam where the right heart now is having trouble pushing blood into the heart because there's a beaver dam there. And so you can wear out your right heart. So you get right ventricular failure. Before that happens, you get pulmonary hypertension. You might get some congestion into the lungs, leaking a little fluid into the lungs. Remember, that's not corpulmonale, right? Because the problem is not the lungs. Right heart failure. Corpulmonale is right heart failure, but it can only be due to lung uh, lung conditions like COPD and here's uh, like I said the mitral valve the same type of deal with a mitral valve here's a mitral valve uh, uh, regurgitation or mitral valve prolapse disease and so when systole occurs some of the blood leaks into the atria 
to left atria. So now the left atria is always overfilled. All right, so the same thing, Starling's principles in a force. So you'll get a more forceful atrial systole, which again overfills this ventricle. Um, so that's going to get more of a contraction during systole. Atrial systole is going to have more of a contraction. You're going to have a beaver dam getting into the into the heart. So there's your pulmonary hypertension. Makes too much strain on the right heart, and the right heart starts to fail. Right, we kind of know that scenario, I think. All right, let's talk about ectopic lentus. So the lens of the eye we normally don't see. It's right behind the cornea, but it's just like those of you who wear glasses. It's just like another lens. And it focuses near and focuses far. And it's held in place by these suspensory ligaments. And, woo, ligaments, okay? Marfan system hits ligaments and connective tissue, and it can stretch out those ligaments, and even they can snap. If they stretch out, the lens starts moving out of position, and that's called a ectopic lentus. Or you could say the lens ha is a, a, has subluxated, and that's not a chiropractic word. That's a medical word. They do use the word subluxation as well. So the lub, the lung, or the lens has subluxated. Very easy to see the condition. Here's a cartoon of it. Remember the suspensory ligaments hold the lens in place, right? Let's see a real picture of it. That's pretty crazy. Now the patient's dilated. See the pupil's been dilated. This is the ophthalmologist's office. Uh, but you can clearly see the suspensory ligaments are gone up here. And it's out of place. Therefore, it reflects brown light. And uh, you can see it. Okay, what about the pathophysiology of Marfan's? Now, I just took a huge section out of here about 20 slides where I used to go back into the central dogma. But I think I did that a little bit in first quarter for you, and I think you should be pretty good. So I'm not going to go over the central dogma in what a chromosome is, because hopefully you know that. Let me know if you're really shaky on that, and I can always put that back in, or I can put that in YouTube. But I think most people are pretty good with that, understand. What's the difference between DNA polymerase and RNA polymerase? Uh, what's the difference between a nucleotide, a nucleoside, and a nucleoside phosphate? Right? What are the building blocks? How do you make a DNA molecule? Right? It's two strands of nucleic acid. How do you make a nucle? Which are how how are the strands of nucleic acid held together? Hydrogen bonding between the base pairs of the so what's or what's the what's the building blocks of a nucleic acid molecule most people just call those nucleotides the really nucleoside phosphate molecules if you want to get specific all right so i took all that out so let me know if that's if you want that back in i can put that back in um, anyway, so here we go, the pathophysiology. So it's caused by a point mutation. Remember, point mutations means that one of the base pairs of the gene, what's a gene, by the way? So we have this, okay, these are all base pairs. This is just one, let's say this is the template strand. Hopefully you know what I'm talking about. All right, and so this is A, this is G, this is T, and it repeats A, G, E, T. And then we should have an A here, but instead we have a, how about a cytosine? And then it repeats a T. So that's not supposed to be there. Okay, so maybe during replication, that got replicated wrong, or for whatever reason, this base pair is messed up. That's called a point mutation, right? A point mutation. Now, if if the because of redundancy, not all point mutations will cause the protein to have a wrong amino acid. Uh, the sequence of the amino acid is messed up. Remember, if the sequence of amino acid is messed up you'll get a folding problem. You won't fold the protein right, and it'll be mutated. 
but not all point mutations cause a wrong amino acid to be implanted. If they do, and that's the problem of Marfan syndrome, you get a point mutation, you get a base change, a single base change, and unfortunately when that is translated by the ribosome, you get a, a wrong amino acid put in the protein chain that makes collagen. And that causes it to fold strangely and it makes it weak and stretchy. And therefore, because that wrong amino acid was implanted, you say that this is a missense mutation. Got that? Missense mutation. Okay, hopefully you know that already. Should have had that in biochem, I'm thinking. Um, or somewhere. I'm not sure where you... Dr. Doe, maybe? I'm not sure where you learned that. Let me know if you haven't learned that stuff. Uh, another aneurysm risk factor. Or what are the aneurysm? Or what are we doing? Oh, another risk factor for aneurysm. So, uh, so there's other things. Ellos Danlers syndrome. There's a different types of Ellos Danlers. Uh, there's a type four, which is the vascular type. So this is another point mutation um, that leads to a missense mutation. It's also autosomal dominant, just like Marfan syndrome, but it's not. Uh, it's not the fimbrolin one gene. Right. This is the fimbrolin one gene problem. This is the same type autosome. It's the same missense mutation, but it's a different gene. It's the Col three A one gene in Ellis Danlers type four that causes the problem. And this one it screws up uh, the type three collagen of these patients is messed up. Marfan's is more widespread. It's all different types of collagen. This one is specific to type three. Uh, but it definitely increases the risk for aneurysm. If you don't have a strong pipe and that pipe's under pressure, that pipe can can kind of bulge out and that's an aneurysm. Or it could even break and that's a bleed and you can die from that. Another one is Louis Dietz syndrome. Uh, that is a, another uh, mutation which involves the transforming growth factor beta gene. Okay, and that's also another, that gene gives rise to another type of collagen uh, that is important in blood vessel walls. Remember that tunica media I showed you? That's kind of slinky how many different collagens there are in there. Um, so uh, this one's also associated with other skeletal deformations like scoliosis and club foot. Um, some research that striadistentia, people with mutated uh, tumor necrosis or transforming growth factor beta genes also have an increased chance for striadistentia, uh, but I think of it more skeletal problems, scoliosis, uh, kind of club foot, pectus excavatum, and there's a whole bunch more of this stuff. Uh, Rubens doesn't mention this, but tertiary syphilis, I haven't dug into the research to confirm Robbins on that, but Robbins is a board book and so is Rubens, so I threw it in there, tertiary syphilis. Uh, another tumor or transforming growth factor beta gene mutation is caused by a syndrome called familial thoracic aortic aneurysm syndrome. That's all we'll say about that. So what else can cause, uh, what else do we have to worry about? Did we leave, it seems like we're missing something on Marfan syndrome, aren't we? We just kind of stopped on Marfan syndrome. I guess that was out of the rabbit hole. So we're talking about aneurysm. I'll have to go look at those slides, but anyway. Um, yep, so other risk factors. Uh, so uh, what are we still talking about? No, we're talking about aneurysms. Uh, sorry about that. Something seems to be a little messed up with this, but I'll take a look at it. But anyway, this is these slides are what you'll be tested on. So, the connective tissue diseases uh, all cause a risk for aneurysm. Uh, what are, what are some other things that cause risk for aneurysm? Uh, well, trauma. You could get a catheter injury uh, to the blood vessel. Fibromuscular dysplasia, which we've talked about, can weaken the blood vessel wall. Do you get an inflammation of the uh, 
but through autoimmune attack or infection, that's called vasculitis. Sometimes the vasculitis starts to form an aneurysm, and when, uh, when a bug forms an aneurysm, that strangely is called a mycotic aneurysm. And because you think of mycotic, you think, well, that's a fungus, right? Mycotic fungus it has nothing to do with a fungus. And uh, they used to think way back in the day it did, and that name kind of stuck, and you can't get rid of it. Um, there are some non-risk factors. This is, I always ask this one, lots of stuff. This is a, for aneurysm, this is a non-risk factor, uh, diabetes mellitus. And you think diabetes is a risk for everything, but this is one exception. Um, not saying that it's good, but it does protect against aneurysm and a bleed. Because people diabetics, they have trouble controlling their sugar. Even the best controlled diabetics have way more bouts of hyperglycemia, too much sugar floating to the blood, than normal people do. So that excess of sugar uh, can get into, kind of like LDLs we talked about, um, it can get in between the endothelial cells and get into the tunics. It can get into the tunic, uh, uh, into the tunica media, specifically. And once it's there, it can bind adjacent collagen. Remember that kind of stretchy, kind of like an accordion, the tunica media? It has all those strands of collagen and elastic tissue running side by side. It can bind, that tissue binds together those strands of collagen and makes them swell and get very thick and stiff. Um, and that's called, of course, non-enzymatic glycation. And that's another thing you should have learned in biochemistry. All right, uh, AKAs for non-enzymatic glycation. We have glycation, glycation-induced cross-linking, because cross-linking is involved. Uh, but this, it makes the tunica media like Superman. So you're not going to have a leak or a bulge there. Uh, so diabetes is protective against the aneurysms. But not so fast. Diabetes has a lot of other blood vessel sequelae. If you make your tunica media super thick like Superman because of this non-enzymatic glycation, you're going to narrow the lumen. And if you narrow the lumen of your blood vessel all over the place, your heart's going to have to pump harder to get through that gigantic semi-beaver dam and that's going to cause hypertension. What's hypertension going to do? That's going to push LDLs underneath the endothelium and it's going to cause a wicked inflammation and that's atherosclerotic. That can lead to placking which can also beaver dam the vessels which causes more hypertension which causes more atherosclerosis and around and around we go into that circle. Uh, the hyperglycemia can also damage nerves and cause pain. You can get a diabet diabetic neuropathy, which is very painful in some patients. It damages the swan cells. More sequelae of diabetes. Capillaries are a different story. There's no tunica media in capillaries, uh, so it's not going to thicken. But what it does do, it causes the capillaries to shrink and pull together. And if the capillaries sh kind of kind of uh, shrink up and leave a bigger space between them, uh, well, you get a leaky capillary and you start to get swelling. Your interstitium starts to get a little puffy. Uh, and that can cause all sorts of trouble. Not so much, you probably won't even notice it in your, uh, in your tissue, but in your eyes and in your peripheral nerves, uh, it can damage the peripheral nerves, which again contributes to diabetic neuropathy, also, which is one of the categories of peripheral myop neuropathy. And you'll treat patients with per per peripheral neuropathy. And it happens in your eyes, you can go blind from that kind of thing. All right, back to the mycotic aneurysm. So that was, that was a bug, kind of bug ball aneurysm, so to speak. It's where patients started off with uh, maybe a little bacteremia, a little bacteria got into the bloodstream and some reason it's stuck somewhere, uh, maybe on scarred up valves of the heart, maybe on an old catheter injury uh, of the tunica intima. For wh whatever reason, the bug's got a foothold. It's usually Staphylococcus aureus that does this, and it destroys the blood vessel to the point that you get uh, a weakness there. 
So aneurysms, in fact, when if you are diagnosed with an aneurysm, which is an outpouching of the blood vessel wall, um, yeah, about 6% of all aneurysms are mycotic aneurysms, which is not caused from fungus again. That's kind of a weird. And I always put that on the test, and somebody always gets tricked on that. But it's from usually a staph aureus. And the weakened vessel can overstay. I mean, it can rip, rupture, right? You can die from that. If you bust a, a high-pressure pipe, you're going to bleed out really fast. By the, time, by the time you can't even make it to the hospital, usually. And <clears throat> so we can get true or false aneurysms. So we need to talk about that. Infectious agent. Where does a mycotic aneurysm, where does this come from? It comes from a cut or a wound. It could come from a surgical wound, it could come from a dental procedure, uh, or just a tissue infection getting into the bloodstream. So as absence and tuberculosis, not so much in our country. Uh, you could burst, the, of course the aneurysm could burst, and you could die from hypovolemic shock. And the other thing, the aneurysm, the blood flow through an uh, these mycotic aneurysms, there's usually saccular aneurysms, which we'll look at in a second. Uh, blood flow is terrible through those things, so that thing is a an a embolism factory. You'll get arterial thrombus that builds up and builds up on the walls and finally breaks loose, and now you got yourself not a venous embolism, but a a a, a or or a an or a um, a arterial aneurysm, which is very deadly, especially if it happens in the ascending aorta, can get up into the brain. Um, and those kind that have come from, that are made of not a blood clot tissue, but are made of bugs, those are called septic embolisms. Why they're not called, somebody always asks me, why aren't they called mycotic aneurysm or mycotic emboli? Um, I don't know. This should really be called septic aneurysms too, but just a problem with the, the field. All right. Um, and they can get stuck, of course, and cause downstream ischemia wherever, uh, wherever they get stuck in. Where are the favorite targets of these mycotic aneurysms? Uh, the abdominal aorta, the, vis uh, the abdominal uh, visceral arteries, uh, like the renal arteries, the mesenteric arteries. What happens if you get a mycotic aneurysm? In a, in a renal artery. It's possible it could decrease the blood flow downstream and you could get uh, a secondary hypertension because the RA, because the kidney beco could become hyperperfused. You can get these in the circle of Willis, which we'll talk about. I mean, they could happen really anywhere. Uh, where else can it start? It likes heart valves, these mycotic aneurysms that were previously scarred up by a valve replacement maybe or rheumatic fever. Uh, atherosclerotic, so it loves the abdominal aorta because uh, atherosclerosis is an inflammatory p uh, condition and it kind of encourages the, uh, the bugs to stick to that area. An old vessel wall injury, we already said that one. Here's a normal aorta here. Uh, this is an arteriogram uh, where the contrast is passing through the abdominal aorta. Here's someone with a mycotic aneurysm. Whoa, see the difference? Yeah, it's way, way blown out. So we've got a saccular type aneurysm here. We're going to look at the types of aneurysms here in a minute. Here's a side view of it, abdominal aorta. It's actually, remember the aorta is pulsatile, uh, so it can scallop the vertebrae. What are the risk factors for aneurysm in general development? Atherosclerosis, that's a good slide. Hypertension. History of bacteremia. History of vasculitis, which is often caused from bacteria, but doesn't have to be. Could be autoimmune. <coughs> An inflammatory condition. Connective tissue disease like Marfan's or Louis Dietz. What's the treatment for an aneurysm? Once it's discovered, you got to see how big it is. You have to repeat the imaging, like you can do an ultrasound to keep an eye on it. But generally, once an aneurysm gets over 5 centimeters in size, it becomes surgical in nature. Because these can't break, right? They're under super high pressure. They break, you're not going to make it. Marfan's, anything over 
uh, 30 millimeters or th uh, 30 centimeters or 3 centimeters. Uh, it becomes surgical. They need to patch it with Darkon. So here's a nice case study. We have an 80-year-old male who was rushed to the emergency room after passing out at home. He regained consciousness, but his uh, his loved one said, Nope, Grandpa, you are going to the hospital. And before that happened, his complaint was not abdominal pain, but it was back pain and buttocks pain. So, I mean, that's we're going to run into that all the time. Um, no abdominal pain. In the ER, his blood pressure was low, 100 over 55. Uh, he did have a hyper history of hypertension, which makes that number even more concerning. Where'd the hypertension go? On abdominal examination, they could palpate a big mass in his abdomen along the midline. And a CT scan found a 10-centimeter aneurysm. How he survived this, I'll tell you how they survived this. We'll talk about uh, it was retroperitoneal aneurysm. But yeah, he was rushed to emergency surgery, uh, and everything went well with him. They replaced uh, this, cut this area out, and put a dark on graft in, and just put some new tubing in. Uh, so the treatment for these aneurysms, uh, they put a dark on graft in. Uh, cut the old one out, put a new tube in there. Uh, the mortality rate in good hospitals is about 2%. So it's semi-risky, but most of the time people do really well. Two out of 100 die. Uh, if it's just a smaller aneurysm, you can manage it conservatively by reducing the blood pressure, right? Reducing cholesterol and fats and stop smoking. Uh, take beta blockers to decrease the power of the heart. And that will decrease sympathetic tone, which decreases hypertension. All right, so there are these aneurysms we've been talking about. There's three different, let's get into them deeper, and let's talk about how they're classified. Uh, there's actually three different types of aneurysms, the board books say. Uh, really, dissecting aneurysms are often a subcategory of a false aneurysm. So why they include that as its own section, I, I don't know. It's just a complication of false aneurysm. But anyway, these are the three types that they say. And so this is where we're going. Uh, a true aneurysm, there's two types of it. There's a fusiform and a saccular. A fusiform, and notice that all of these true aneurysms, the all the tunics, tunica intima, media, and adventitia, are all intact. They're not ripped, but they've gotten weak f for whatever reason, and they've gotten stretchy because we have really high-pressure blood flowing here through here, but that's definitely imparting pressure on the walls and if the pressure finds a weak area it'll start to balloon it out and that's exactly what happens with a fusiform it's a general outpouching of a section sometimes a very large section of an of a blood vessel of the aorta high pressured pipe saccular aneurysm is more localized more focal so there's still the wall is not defective uh, but it's it's really weak in this area and so when the blood pressure goes through everything else is fine but it finds this weak spot and really pushes it out so that's a more and these can be they can look like this they, they can be they can be embolism factories here as well All right so those are the true aneurysms the false aneurysm um, has a rip the reason the blood er, is getting in and pushing out the aorta is because there's a flat out rip in the wall okay so that could be from trauma and we'll look at these I'm just kinda whetting your appetites here a dissection also usually starts as a rip as a true aneurysm or as a false aneurysm but instead of the blood making it through the tunica or the last tunics here it gets stuck usually in the middle of the tunica media and it finds that it can't get through the tunica adventitia, but it finds that it can actually rip itself down through the middle of the tunica media. And that's a dissecting aneurysm. Uh, very, very dangerous. Probably the most dangerous of all of these, I would say. All right, so let's go through these again. Pretty much everything I just said. So a true aneurysm is a ballooning out of the entire blood vessel wall. 
Uh, it could be a focal balloon, like a saccular aneurysm, or it could be just a general balloon of the whole thing. All right, so those are the two types. There's no defect. There's no dissection going on. Uh, it's just a general ballooning out. Can you have a dissecting aneurysm inside of a true? Yeah, you can do that as well. Uh, but the dissection is not, uh, it's, it's not causing, it wasn't caused by a rip. This is caused by a general outpouching here. But it could later turn into a dissection. All right, so saccular and fusiform. Saccular, I mean, we've really just explained this already. Sa a, a saccular true aneurysm is a focal weakening. And that blood vessel wall can stretch and stretch and stretch. And this thing, again, you can get thrombus because the blood flow is terrible in here. And you can get a huge chunk of that broken out. And that can get loose and go downstream. And uh, maybe it goes in the renal artery, causes a beaver dam. Maybe it completely makes the kidney ischemic and you lose your kidney. Maybe it gets stuck, but some blood gets around it. And so you get hypertension because of that. Uh, but that's a saccular. Um, they range from 5 to 20 millimeters. As I said, it's a breeding ground for thrombus formation. Really dangerous because of its ability to throw emboli. And it depends where the saccular aneurysm occurs. Anything downstream is fair game. If it happens, it uh, usually doesn't happen, but if it does happen in the ascending aorta and you throw an embolism, that could go through. Uh, how about the left carotid artery? And then it goes into the internal carotid artery, goes up into the noodle, gets uh, stuck in the noodle somewhere. Now you got yourself a massive stroke. So anywhere, to, it all depends where it occurs. Fusiform, again, the entire circumference is bulged out. This is by far the most common type of aneurysm. Uh, there's no rupture. It's just a weak spot. And... Typically involves very long segments compared to saccular. Maybe, maybe the entire abdominal aorta could be affected by this. Uh, they can reach up to 20 centimeters in diameter, so they can stretch out quite a bit. And it could involve the entire aortic arch. It could, it could involve anywhere. False aneurysms, as we said, it's a flat-out rip through the wall, usually caused by trauma. Uh, hitting your chest really hard against the steering wheel uh, can cause a concussion injury enough to rip through the tunics. You could be been stabbed by some a knife or something. A rib fracture in that same accident could poke the blood vessel. Uh, an infection can eat a hole in that. Therefore, it'd be called the mycotic aneurysm. Very dangerous, right? Because it's prone to rupture. Uh, usually the only thing holding the blood in the artery is the connective tissue around the tunica externa. If it does heal up, great, but then you'll always be at risk for a, a subsequent mycotic aneurysm because bugs like to stick to that scarred up, uh, that scarred up tunica intima. And yeah, luminal blood will escape through the intima, go through the tunics, and sometimes all that, the connective tissue is the only thing holding the blood inside the artery. If that rips, you're going to probably die. Could uh, progress to a dissecting aneurysm as well, uh, as we were going to talk about. Uh, these are the type that are palpable. I'll teach you how to palpate these. Uh, but... There's a picture of basically this person is doing it a little low. It should be actually done right in this region is where you want to palpate it. Um, but yeah, your this is one test that's actually really good. So this sensitivity is uh, 97%. So it's good for ruling it out. If you can't feel one, there's pretty good odds you don't have one. So good sensitivity for this. Snout to rule it out. Okay, dissecting aneurysms, uh, so aka aortic dissection, dissecting aneurysms, dissecting aortic aneurysms. Uh, as we said already, that's where blood gets into the tunica media, usually from a false aneurysm. 
and it doesn't make it all the way through the vessel, but the blood finds that it can go downward in the tunica media, and it rips its way longitudinally down. Uh, and it's because of the buildup of pressure. And it's usually start as a false aneurysm, which don't make it all the way through the arteries. It gets stuck in the tunica media, then rips itself down. Here's a nice little picture of what. So here is a, a rip in the tunica intima, and the blood the pressure for whatever reason couldn't get through the tunic adventitia but it could actually find that it could rip itself down within the tunica media and it got worse and worse and worse and worse and at this stage it's right here so this this region that's called the false lumen this is called the true lumen so and what has happened to the true lumen well it's supposed to be this big and you can see it's not. It's lost about 30% of its size. So we got a little beaver dam starting here. What's that going to do to the pulses, by the way? Right, there's your left subclavian artery going down to your left radial pulse and brachial pulse. So it might exaggerate them, right? Because you have increased pressure here. You might get exaggerated uh, pulses here. And what about downstream? You might get decreased pulses, the femoral pulse, popliteal pulse, etc. Another danger of this thing, what's the blood going to be doing in here? Besides causing a beaver dam, it's going to clot. Right? And you can say the blood's going to clot here. This is a hematoma can form. So we got we got blood clots forming here. Well, great, but the trouble with these is this word right here, double barrel. Eventually the pressure's going to get so big that almost all the time it double barrels. Uh, so you get one hole here and you get one hole down here. So it rips itself back into the true lumen, uh, which is a very dangerous moment because all these blood clots are released. So these are all embolisms. And they are flowing downstream looking for trouble. Thank goodness it didn't happen here so you can't get a stroke, right? Because that's the only way you can get a stroke is, is to go up that pipe or that pipe because those can lead to the internal carotid artery. So you're not going to get a stroke, but maybe it'll go into the celiac trunk and get stuck in the celiac trunk. That would be bad, right? There goes your liver. You lose a piece of your liver, your intestine, your spleen, uh, part of your, or your stomach. So that would be a disaster. So these can be, I mean, devastating. Right? And that's, what, that's exactly what happens in most uh, cervical manipulations, which causes stroke. Same kind of story which happens. Usually you create a double barrel. You could have plaque, atherosclerotic plaque as well, and you could break off a piece of plaque and do that. But we'll get to that. All right. There's the false lumen, true lumen. Here's a angiography again, and you can see the lumen, the true lumen. And you can see a false lumen, right? And there's the wall. So that's blood. That's a that's a dissecting aneurysm right there. And you can see it's caused some stenosis. It's caused a beaver dam. Well, what are the clinical findings? Well, your downstream pulses will be, if a beaver dam's occurred, because the false lumen pushed into the true lumen, you'll have decreased downstream pulses, and you'll have downstream ischemia as well. So you might have some skin change. You might have pain. Right? It could have put pain. Maybe you'll have claudication pain. Right? Could have added claudication pain in there as well. Uh, so increase upstream pulses, as I said, from the beaver dam. Burger's test will be positive, right? You, you're not having good blood flow in the extremities. So you do Burger's test, that's going to be uh, raise the 60 60, right? Raise the. The patient supine, raise both straight leg rays up to 60 degrees. Watch for pallor. Both feet get pallor within maybe 15 seconds. All right, and you do ankle brachial index test, and it's maybe down 0.7. So positive ankle brachial index test, positive Berger's test. And the R2A system will be on if it's up above, if it's, if the beaver dam is upstream to the renal arteries, you're going to have hypertension starting. Right? The kidneys are going to be underperfused. Again, as I said, that 
the false lumen, the blood in there is highly thrombogenic. It's has a big tendency to clot, and that clot is cause a hematoma, and very dangerous when it double barrels. And we just talked about double barreling. Um, so let's do it again. So double barreling means that it, it the blood has ripped itself into the tunica media, and eventually it downstream it rips another hole and goes back into the true lumen. Uh, and that's very common. In fact, it's almost understood that double barreling will occur. But when it does occur, it's very dangerous because all those blood clots are released. And now you have yourself arterial emboli. Right? So here's a little cartoon. Uh, and you can see the blood has, we got all these blood clots and it just double barreled and it released all these blood clots and they're going downstream. Uh, and maybe they get stuck. Uh, oh, you pick the artery. How about the superior mesenteric artery? Right? Well, there goes a big chunk of your intestine is going to become ischemic. So that's why you have to know your blood vessels so good so you can understand how this pathology works. There's another cartoon. There's a big intramural hematoma. Sometimes it's called intramural, meaning it's in between the tunics where it occurs. And it's double barreled, and you got yourself a huge embolism flying downstream. Uh, dissecting aneurysms, about 95% of the, start, the time, as I've already said, it starts as a tear in the tunica media. So technically, it starts out as a false, uh, false aneurysm. Uh, but, uh, the, as we said a couple times already, the, the blood is stopped through the outer layer of the tunica media, and the, the tunica adventitia can't get through, so it pressure builds up and it finds itself easy to rip down. I can probably take that slide right out of there. Where's the favorite place to occur? Uh, unfortunately, some really bad places. The root of the aorta, that's the ascending aorta. Uh, so these dissections often lead to stroke. Uh, these are nasty. When they double barrel, uh, they can get up uh, and get into the brain. Uh, the proximal one-third of the descending, so they're uh, they're up high, right? Well, that makes sense because where's the pressure the highest? Pressure is highest up here. Another one, now this is vertebral artery can do this, uh, but you can have, remember we talked about the vasorum. Uh, those big arteries, they need, especially the uh, the tissue, the tunica adventitia in particular, that cannot, that can't get nutrients by simple diffusion. Right? So oxygen can diffuse about this far and service all the, the cells here, but it can't get out here. So we have to have a blood vessel within a blood vessel. They could come from the outside and they can service this area here. Uh, this one is just kind of coming from the lumen. They can do that as well. But here we developed an aneurysm in the vasora, and the aneurysm broke and now we have high pressure blood here. And this blood isn't strong enough to rip through the tunic adventitia, but it certainly is strong enough to start working its way down. Um, and these don't, the pressure isn't super high here, so they may never double barrel, uh, but they certainly could cause some stenosis, luminal stenosis of the true lumen. Uh, but they can fill up with clots, just like, just like before. If they do, if you, let's say you have a chiropractic manipulation or you're painting, your ceiling or you're putting up can lights or whatever, twisting and turning your neck in an extended position, you could double barrel this and uh, yeah, that'll go up right into the brain and you're in, you're going to have a stroke from that. Right? So everything we've said r results in an intramural hematoma. They typically don't double barrel. Uh, they can progressively grow and cause stenosis though. Uh, some risk factors for dissections. Well, any any condition that causes a risk for a false aneurysm. Um, so blunt chest trauma, uh, surgical catheter procedures. Uh, having any of these connective tissue disorders too weakens the uh, the tissue weakens the walls of a blood vessel. So any of the uh, the big four here: Marfan's, Louis Dietz, Ellis Daniels, neurofibromatosis one is another one doesn't happen that often, but it can certainly happen. Uh, blunt force trauma. Yeah, everything we talked about. 
All the risk factors for a false aneurysm are risk factors for dissection. Uh, history of hypertension and smoking are st very strong risk factors. And history of a previous vasculitis, so he had an infection of the blood vessel wall, makes it weak, not as strong as it used to be. How about some demographics for dissecting aneurysms? They're typically older men, 50 years, uh, with pre-existing hypertension. In fact, 80% of all cases are associated with hypertension, pre-existing hypertension. And there are some, the younger men who succumb to these dissecting aneurysms, they almost always have a connective tissue disease. So again, Marfan's, Louis Dietz, uh, neurofibromatosis 1, type 4 Ellis-Danlos syndrome. Aortic dissections, or ascending aortic dissections, they account for 65% of all dissections. Again, it's the worst possible place to have one. There is a chance, a good chance of stroke if double barreling occurs, which it usually does, and so can be really, really dangerous, di these dissections. Uh, it could also rip backwards, because remember the, there's the heart, the left ventricle, here's the aorta. Right, if you get a dissection, it could actually rip back into the aortic valve here, and it can mess around with the aortic valve. Also remember that the pericardium connects right into here. Right, so if you pop one of these things and get a bleed, you can get blood in the pericardial cavity and squish the heart. That's called cardiac tamponade. Uh, so those are some of the complications of these ascending aortic dissecting aneurysms. You can get cardiac tamponade. You can get aortic regurgitation because it interferes with the closure of the aortic valve. Uh, so no good. Right? There's just the pieces. We're going to start talking about there's different classifications of these and these dissections we'll talk about next time. But there's the ascending aorta. The ascending aorta runs from kind of the root, so this is the root of the aorta here. Um, and yep, it stops right where you get that takeoff of that brachiocephalic trunk. Uh, another AK for that you may not know is the nominate artery, uh, which is a good, it's because it's really, you think trunk, I always think lymph, right? So it's like kind of not the greatest name uh, because lymph has nothing to do. So a nominate artery is probably better, but Nevertheless, uh, then we have the left carot common carotid, and then we have the left subclavian. Those make up the aortic arch. Right after the left subclavian, even though it's still arching, that's not the arch anymore. Uh, that's the descending aorta. We can have dissections other where or other places, like the descending thoracic aorta. Notice how it goes with uh, uh, pressure here. The, the aortic arch is pretty hard to get a dissection in because it has all those pipes coming off of it. It's only 10% in the aortic arch itself. The abdominal aorta makes up about 5% of dissecting aneurysms. If it ruptures, no good, right? It's under high pressure, so you'll bleed and your blood pressure will drop like a stone, and you could well go into hypovolemic shock. We'll talk about a little kind of saving grace for at least abdominal aortic aneurysms. Uh, but yeah, it's very serious up in this area. Yeah, uh, death is imminent unless you're really close to a hospital. How do you make the diagnosis? Uh, a, commuta a CT, computed tomography, <coughs> with 3D reconstruction is nice. MRI study is the next best thing. Third best thing is ultrasound. But a CT scan with contrast is the gold standard. Got it? And <clears throat> with regard to morbidity and mortality, it really depends about what, what part of the aorta you're talking about. Uh, the closer you are to the ascending aorta, they increase the morbidity and mortality rates. And then that's going to bring us to the DeBakey the classification system in the Stanford classification system for dissecting aneurysms. And that, that's what we'll get into next time. See you guys later.